Welcome. Shalom. Ramadan Mubarak. I am Avi Shulman, Rabbi of Temple Beth Torah. This is the 38th year that the Tri-City Interfaith Council has sponsored a Yom HaShoah Holocaust commemoration service. On this night, we remember the catastrophic events that transpired in Europe from 1933 to 1945 during the Nazi regime. We gathered to mourn the death of six million Jews, as well as five million people of other faiths and backgrounds. I want to express my appreciation to my friends on the Interfaith Council for their continuing sponsorship of this evening. Special thanks go to the planning committee of this service, Joy Barnitz, jo Joe Green, Shamsa Rafe, Shari Ghent, and Robert Hoffman. During this time of enormous challenge, as we all cope with the global threat of COVID-19, we might have determined not to hold this service due to the restriction of sheltering in place. However, through the utilization of Zoom, we hope this service will reach a broad congregation throughout the Tri-City area. We are especially indebted to the Reverend Jeffrey Spencer for his skill in hosting this, this service on Zoom. I also want to thank our service participants, Sister Annette Burkhart, the Reverend Joe Green, Joy Barnitz, cantorial soloist Mike Regal, and our guest speaker, Ezra Rettler. Let us now begin our service with our opening meditation and prayer. We being with silence, the silence of death, the silence after destruction. There are many times when songs falter, when darkness fills life, when martyrdom becomes a constellation of faith against the unrelieved black of space about us. There are no words to reach beyond the edge of night, no messenger to tell the full tale. There is only silence, the silence of Job, the silence of the six million, the silence of memory. Let us remember them as we link our silences. We pause now to remember a time when night overcame the light of day, when darkness dimmed the sun and it seemed to be no more. Six million Jews, among them one and a half million children, a third of the people of the covenant, were sent to their death in the gas chambers of Europe. Auschwitz, Dachau, Buchenwald, Treblinka, Bergen-Belsen, Theresienstadt. These very names evoke horror and terror. And yet we recall these names and the barbarous acts associated with them so that the travail of our brothers and sisters may inspire generations yet unborn to learn well the lessons of an evil time their memory must remain forever etched in the conscience of humanity. As we recall their unanswered cries, we pledge ourselves never again to be silent in the face of tyranny or injustice. We need to transform grief into compassion. We must give evidence of our remembering them through acts of kindness and courage. Thus will our actions serve as monuments to the spirit of those who perished. O oh God, remember your martyred children as we pledge to remember them. Eternal One, remember also the millions of those innocents 
who likewise died in that inhuman time, we light a candle in memory of all who perished. If the prophets broke in through the doors of night and sought an ear like a homeland, ear of mankind overgrown with nettles, would you hear? If the voice of the prophets blew on flutes made of murdered children's bones, and exhaled airs burnt with martyrs' cries, if they build a bridge of old men's dying groans. Ear of mankind, occupied with small sounds, would you hear? Nellie Sachs. Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into wreaths of smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames which consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget that nocturnal silence which deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things, even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. From night by Elie Wiesel. You who live secure in your warm houses, who return at evening to find hot food and friendly faces. Consider whether this is a man who labors in the mud, who knows no peace, who fights for a crust of bread, who dies at a yes or a no. Consider whether this is a woman without hair or name, with no more strength to remember, eyes empty and womb as a frog in winter cold. Consider that this has been, I commend these words to you, engrave them on your hearts. When you are in your house, when you walk on your way, when you go to bed, when you rise, repeat them to your children, or may your house crumble, disease render you powerless, and your offspring avert their faces from you. Prima Levy. It was the cold winter of 1944, and although we had nothing like calendars, my father, who was my fellow prisoner there, took me and some of our friends to a corner in our barrack. He announced that it was the eve of Hanukkah, produced a curious shaped clay bowl and began to light a wick immersed in his precious but now melted margarine ration. Before he could recite the first blessing, I protested at the waste of food. He looked at me, then at the lamp, and finally said, you and I have seen that it is possible to live up to three weeks without food. We once lived almost three days without water, but you cannot live properly for three minutes without hope. Hugo Grimm. The garden. A little garden, fragrant and full of roses. The path is narrow and a little boy walks along it. A little boy, a sweet boy, like that growing blossom. When the blossom comes to bloom, the little boy will be no more. By Franta Bass. <laughs> 
it is my honor this evening to introduce Ezra Brettler, our guest speaker for our service. Ezra is joining us from San Francisco, where he works for a tech company. Both of his maternal grandparents survived the Holocaust. His grandmother, Frida, was born in Vilna, Poland, and survived the war hiding in the Polish countryside after escaping the Vilna ghetto. Tonight, Ezra will be sharing with us the story of his grandfather, Karl Rosner, who was born in Hamburg, Germany. Thank you for the introduction, Rabbi Shulman. I'm Ezra Brettler, and as Rabbi Shulman mentioned, I'm going to be speaking with you today about my grandfather, Karl Rosner. In many ways, my grandfather and I have a normal grandfather-grandson relationship. I always looked forward to going to his house as a young kid. If I'm being honest, the fact that he had the best gummy bears and chocolate played a significant role in that. Here's a photo of him that was taken in 2014 with all six of his grandchildren. Last summer, he became a great grandfather. Over the years, my grandfather taught me many things about life. But one of the first things he taught me was how to play chess. His mother had taught him how to play in his youth, and he was eager to pass that knowledge along to me. Grandpa would always win. He never took it easy on me. And at the end of each game, he would often point to a fork in the road moment, a move where he made a crucial mistake that ultimately cost me the game. The fact that he grew up playing chess might make it seem like he had, a formal, he had a fairly normal childhood. But I wouldn't be speaking with you today if that were the case. I'm going to share with all of you the story of how he survived the brutality of the Nazi regime as a Jewish teen living in Germany without any parents looking out for him. In that story, there were many fork in the road moments, moments where things could have easily gone very differently where my grandfather's life was quite literally hanging in the balance. Yes, he was extremely lucky, but also several people stepped up to help him in critical ways. I want to leave you with a key learning that you might take from my grandfather's story. There's a tremendous power in seeing the humanity in others and acting to help those in need, regardless of what the government says or what terrible position you may be in yourself. Before I dive into the story, I want to share a brief video of my grandfather from April of this year. Or I guess it was, it was now a full year ago now. He just turned 91 a few weeks ago. And unfortunately, he's slowed down a little bit, so it's not his best energy level. But I want you to hear his voice and meet him virtually. Hi, I'm Carl H. Rosner. I was born in Hamburg, Germany. And I'm very happy to be in the United States now, which I think is still the best country in the world. Uh, my wife and I were very happy coming here when we were both young. We had all our children here. And uh, I am lucky enough to still be alive after all the trials and tribulations that I've had in my youth. I think uh, it's an example of somebody who's been lucky enough to survive, but yet has been exposed to all the terrible things that Germany as a civilized country has done to kill 6 million Jews, of which in particularly I'm very, very sad, we included a million and a half children from infants to teenagers. And it is important that the world knows what a civilized country can do and has done so that it never ever happens again by people hearing the story from somebody who's been surviving it and yet is still terrified and traumatized by what has happened to him. <laughs> 
don't be misled by my grandfather's calm, factual tone and manner. As he mentioned at the end, what happened to him was unimaginably traumatic. He gave you a preview of what made his childhood so difficult, but I'll be going into much more detail. My grandfather lives near Albany, New York. He's in fairly good health, all things considered, but going through his story in detail has become much harder for him. So I'll have to do my best to do his remarkable story justice. My grandfather, whose full name is Karl Heinz Rosner, was born in Hamburg, Germany on April 4th, 1929. At that time, there were about 1.1 million people living in Hamburg, making it one of the largest cities in Germany. My grandfather was the eldest of three boys in a middle-class family. His mother, Rahel, was an entrepreneur. She owned a bedding store, which we have a picture of on the slide here. My grandfather was just three years old when Hitler rose to power on January 30th, 1933. One year after that, my grandfather's maternal grandfather, the one in this passport photo, saw that things were starting to get worse for Jews in Germany and decided to move to Palestine, an area that's now called Israel. The area was controlled by the British at the time, as Israel didn't exist as a country until 1948, almost 15 years later. Much of my grandfather's extended family followed to Palestine, but my grandfather's parents decided to stay in Hamburg. Soon after that, the Nazis closed his mother's business as Jews were stripped of the right to own a business along with many other fundamental rights. Around that same time, my grandfather's parents got divorced and his father returned back to Romania where he had originally been born. One major hint of the horrors to come came the night of November 9th 1938, when my grandfather was just nine years old, a couple of months after this photo was taken. On this night and continuing the next day, the Nazis lit fire to several hundred synagogues, smashed the windows of Jewish businesses, and around 30,000 Jewish men were arrested for no reason other than their religion and imprisoned in concentration camps. One direct result of this was an effort called the Kinder Transport which translates to children's transport. This was an effort led primarily by a group of British Jewish charities to save Jewish children living in Germany by transporting them to live with foster families in England. In the following nine months, almost 10,000 mainly Jewish children traveled alone to England. My grandfather's youngest brother, Elliot, was fortunate enough to secure a spot on one of these transports and he was one of about 500 children that was sent to live in Sweden rather than England. My grandpa Carl's mother, Rahel, worried about her youngest son, smuggled herself into Sweden so that she could keep an eye on him. She then placed my grandfather and his middle brother, Joseph Wolfgang, in a Jewish orphanage and tried to get them visas so that they too could come to Sweden. So my grandfather and his brother were suddenly separated from their mom when they were just nine and eight years old. As an aside, everyone called my grandfather's brother by his nickname, Wolfie. So I'll call him that moving forward. World War II officially started at the beginning of September, 1939. As the war progressed, the Nazis increased the severity of the policies which discriminated against Jews. My grandfather and Wolfie made the most of their difficult situation, making friends with the other young boys at the orphanage. One of my grandfather's favorite activities at the orphanage was playing chess with the other children. And he also did a lot of reading. In the spring of 1942, my grandfather had his bar mitzvah at the orphanage. By this time, two million Jews had already been killed in Poland and Ukraine. Just a couple of months after my grandfather's bar mitzvah, the Nazis closed his Jewish school, along with the rest of the Jewish schools throughout Germany, on June 30th, 1942. At this time, the children living in the orphanage, the ones pictured in these photos, were loaded into a truck and sent to various concentration camps. <laughs> 
The Nazis, they called them internment camps to people who were being sent there so as to make them seem not as horrible as they truly were. This was one of the key fork in the road moments in my grandfather's story. For reasons that we're still not totally clear on, he and Wolfie were told that they didn't have to go to an internment camp. They initially protested, not understanding what going to an internment camp truly meant and not wanting to be split up from all of their friends from the orphanage. But a man named Max Plout, who was head of the Jewish community of Hamburg at the time, and had a better understanding of what this choice really meant. He told them that if they were told that they didn't have to go, they mustn't go. So instead of going to a concentration camp, my grandfather and Wolfie were allowed to stay in Hamburg and they moved into a Jewish old age home. In early 1943, the elderly folks living in the Jewish old age home were sent to a concentration camp and the two boys were taken in by Emanuel and Gertrude Seinfeld, the married couple pictured here that had previously worked at the Jewish orphanage. The Seinfelds had sent their daughter Ava to England on the kinder transport, as they thought she'd be safer there. During this extremely difficult time, when they were struggling to be so far away from their own daughter, and in a period of war where everyone was having trouble finding enough food for themselves even to make it to the next day, Emmanuel and Gertrude Seinfeld took care of my grandfather and Wolfie as if the boys were their own biological children. In July of 1943, the U.S. and Great Britain initiated an enormous bombing campaign over Hamburg that lasted for eight full days. More than half of the city was destroyed in an effort to slow down the production of weapons that were part of the German war effort. As it turns out, this was another fork in the road moment that had huge consequences. I mentioned before that Carl's mom, Rahel, was working hard to try to get the two boys visas so that they too could come to Sweden. Rahel was ultimately successful in that effort as she got those visas approved in mid 1943. But this bombing of Hamburg destroyed so much of the infrastructure of the city, including the delivery of mail, that my grandfather and Wolfie were never notified that they had been given permission to go to Sweden. So they stayed in Hamburg, hoping that they would continue to be able to avoid trouble there. In 1943, Wolfie had his bar mitzvah in Hamburg. In June of 1944, a couple of months after my grandfather had turned 15, it was clear that his and Wolfie's luck had run out. It had been more than five years since they had last seen their parents. The boys were notified that they were being sent to an internment camp called Buchenwald. Even at this late stage in the war, they still did not know the true horrible nature of what happened at places like Buchenwald. The next day, a regular police officer came and arrested them, and they took a regular passenger train to Weimar, a five-hour drive away. When they arrived in Weimar, they were held in a local prison there for a few nights. Eventually, a cattle car filled with prisoners from Eastern Europe was passing through Weimar on the way to Buchenwald, and they joined that train. When they arrived at Buchenwald, my grandfather and Wolfie were greeted by vicious dogs barking and lunging at them, and members of the SS screaming out orders to them. The main gate at Buchenwald, pictured here, it read, to each what he deserves. It wasn't enough that the physical conditions at this concentration camp were horrible. The Nazis also tried to wage psychological warfare on these prisoners and turn them against each other. The cattle car had arrived at the camp late at night, so they were taken to the disinfection building and told to sleep on the floor there. My grandfather and Wolfie did their best to try to fall asleep in this scary new environment. They had brought their warm winter coats with them and were using these coats as pillows. In the middle of the night, they were awakened as another one of the prisoners who had arrived at the camp with no possessions of his own was trying to steal Wolfie's coat from under his head. 
My grandfather called out for help, and someone who worked in the sorting building came over to see what all the commotion was about. This was another fork in the road moment. The man who came over to investigate was named Erwin Lippmann. He was part of the active communist underground at Buchenwald and turned out to be a guardian angel for my grandfather and Wolfie while they were imprisoned at Buchenwald. You see, Buchenwald was established in July of 1937, before World War II even started. And most of the early prisoners in the camp were either suspected or actual communists. By the time my grandfather and Wolfie arrived at Buchenwald, many of the veterans of the camp were communists who had been there for several years. And these prisoners were given positions of power within the camp. Some of these prisoners chose to use that power to help other prisoners. And they formed an informal underground organization, which met in secret. They often would literally meet below the ground in Buchenwald's sewer system because they knew that the SS guards would never dare to go down to the sewers. It's hard to know exactly why Erwin Littmann, whose prisoner card is pictured here, did so much to help my grandfather and Wolfie. He probably helped many other people at, Ham, at, excuse me, at Buchenwald as well. But one factor is that Littmann was also born in Hamburg and he was Jewish as well. Littmann explained to my grandfather that he shouldn't worry about Wolfie's jacket because it would soon be confiscated, but that he would try to do his best to help the boys out while they were at Buchenwald. The next morning, my grandfather and Wolfie were officially processed as new prisoners at the camp. Along with all the other incoming prisoners, their heads were shaved, any valuables they had were taken from them, and they were sprayed with disinfectant, completely stripped of their humanity. A photo of my grandfather was taken, and he was issued his prisoner card and given his prisoner number, 38156. He was given a fabric number, shown here, to sew to his prisoner uniform. These numbers were part of the Nazi strategy to dehumanize concentration camp prisoners. You weren't a human being. You were just a number. Now, Buchenwald was part of a larger concentration camp system across the territory that the Nazis came to control in Europe. Some camps, like Auschwitz, had the purpose of extermination, while others were focused on forced labor. Buchenwald was a forced labor camp, primarily for men but many of the prisoners there were worked to death and the living conditions were unimaginable. At Buchenwald, the Nazis imprisoned various persecuted populations, political prisoners, Jews, and homosexuals, among others. It is estimated that between 40,000 and 55,000 prisoners died at Buchenwald. At first, my grandfather and Wolfie were placed in what was called the Little Camp at Buchenwald, with one of the buildings from that part of the camp pictured here. This area of the camp was intended for prisoners who were being transferred from other concentration camps, typically, or were otherwise not healthy enough to work. Diseases were particularly common in the Little Camp, and prisoners here received even less food than in the main part of the camp. We heard an excerpt from Elie Wiesel's Night earlier. Wiesel was actually living in the little camp while he was at Buchenwald, and he is one of the prisoners in this photo. After a short time, Erwin Littmann was able to get my grandfather and Wolfie transferred to the main camp to Block 22, which was a Jewish block. Wolfie was given a place to sleep on a crowded bench on one side of the building, and my grandfather on the other. Going back to the photo of the typical barrack, take a moment to look at how crowded these buildings were, how everyone was squeezed in like sardines, with one prisoner literally on top of the other. Buchenwald was originally built to hold 8,000 prisoners, but at its peak, the camp held 86,000 prisoners.
meals were distributed only once a day in the evening. Prisoners were given a small amount of soup and a thin slice of stale bread after having eaten absolutely nothing for the entire day. And this was not some sort of chunky soup with beans or other protein. It was pretty much just hot water. My grandfather remembers constantly being hungry, finding it difficult to think about anything else aside from the pain in his stomach. Roll call each morning was torture. You had to stand still while the guards would call out the numbers of each and every prisoner in the entire camp, one at a time. Some mornings, the guards would make an example out of prisoners who had tried to escape the previous day by hanging them in front of everyone else, using the gallows that you see in this photo. My grandfather was given a job working to create bricks out of clay. Imagine being forced to do that at the age of 15. And the idea was to quite literally work these prisoners to death. The most dreaded punishment was to spend time working in the quarry, where prisoners were made to pull extremely heavy rocks and small carts as a punishment for even the smallest infraction. As the weather grew colder in the winter, the struggle to survive became even more desperate. As you can see in this photo, the prisoners' uniforms were extremely thin, similar to pajamas, and providing very little protection from the freezing cold wind. In December of 1944, my grandfather became very sick. I mentioned how roll call worked earlier. If someone didn't show up at roll call, they would most likely be killed. It became difficult for my grandfather to make it out of block 22 in the morning. And after a few days, my grandfather's condition got worse and making it to roll call became impossible. This meant that my grandfather had no other choice but to go to the Buchenwald infirmary. This was a last resort, as anyone who showed up at the Buchenwald infirmary was at a very high risk of being sent away to be killed. Prisoners were considered useless if they couldn't work. My grandfather had two visits to the infirmary, as you can see recorded on this card here, for a lung infection at the end of December and for the flu in February. As a result of one of these visits, he was selected to be transferred to an extermination camp similar to Auschwitz, which would have likely meant he would be killed. This was another fork in the road moment. Erwin Lippmann, the Jewish prisoner from Hamburg who was part of the communist underground at Buchenwald, the man my grandfather had met his first night at the camp, was able to intervene to keep that transfer from happening. And my grandfather gradually became healthy enough to start working again. As the weather started to warm up in the spring of 1945, there was just a little bit of optimism in the air. As rumors were starting to circulate in the camp that Germany was losing the war. April 4th, 1945 was my grandfather's 16th birthday. And Erwin Lippmann gave him an extra couple portions of bread as a birthday present. Just a few days later, as the American army started to advance close to Buchenwald, the SS guards started rounding up prisoners and marching them in the opposite direction of the advancing troops. Historians call these marches death marches because prisoners were forced to march by foot for miles and miles with no food, and those who could not keep up were simply shot. Around 30,000 prisoners were marched out of Buchenwald and about one third of them did not survive the march. This was the final fork in the road moment for my grandfather and Wolfie, because they did not go on the death march. My grandfather had a suspicion that all of this unusual activity was bad news. So he went to Erwin Lippmann for advice, and Lippmann helped my grandfather and Wolfie find a place to hide until the coast was clear. My grandfather and Wolfie, they hid in the Buchenwald sewers for a couple of days during this time until the coast was clear. Finally, on the morning of April 11th, 1945, the American troops moving east finally arrived at Buchenwald and freed the 20,000 prisoners that were still there. 
The prisoners could hardly believe their eyes. The rumors were true. And the soldiers couldn't believe what they were seeing either. Buchenwald was the first major concentration camp that American troops had discovered and liberated. And the young troops were shocked and appalled by what they saw. Thin, starving men staring out at them on the other side of the barbed wire. My grandfather and Wolfie actually spent a few more months at Buchenwald after the American troops had arrived, slowly nursing themselves back to health until they were well enough to travel. One day, there was a truck that was heading back to Hamburg, and my grandfather Wolfie and Erwin Littmann journeyed back to their hometown. There, they parted ways, and my grandfather and Wolfie took a bus to Sweden. When they finally made it to Sweden and were reunited with their mother, she was in a state of disbelief. She had been convinced that they had been killed by the Nazis and her sons were hardly recognizable to her. They had been young boys, nine and eight years old, when they separated from her about seven years earlier. But now they were young men that had miraculously survived the horrible conditions of Buchenwald for almost a full year. The war in Europe officially ended in May of 1945, but the trauma of the Holocaust didn't end at that point for folks like my grandfather and Wolfie, who had lived through it. Yes, they were very lucky to survive, but they would never be able to live a normal life after everything they had gone through. I want to return to that key learning that I mentioned at the beginning. There's a tremendous power in seeing the humanity in others and acting to help those in need, just like Emanuel and Gertrude Seinfeld and Erwin Littmann did. Regardless of what the government says or what terrible position you may be in yourself, I hope that this message will stick with you. For the sin of silence, for the sin of indifference, for the secret complicity of the neutral, for the closing of borders, for the washing of hands, for the crime of the indifference, for the sin of silence, for closing of borders, for all that was done, for all that was not done. Let there be no forgetfulness before the throne of glory. Let there be remembrance within the human heart. And let there at last be forgiveness when your children, O oh God, are free and at peace. Let there be perfect rest for the souls of the six million who died as Jews in the claims of the Shoah. Let there be perfect rest for the countless millions who died because of race, religion, or nationality, political affiliation, or sexual orientation. Let there be perfect rest for the souls of the righteous who risked all they had to hide and rescue Jews during the Holocaust. Hold them close to you, O oh God, forever. Seal their souls for everlasting life in the shelter of your presence, for you are their eternal home. And let us say, Amen. We remember all who perished by reciting the Kaddish the traditional Jewish prayer for the dead. This prayer is not a funeral hymn, but an affirmation of God's everlasting presence and dominion, praising God's existence and creative love. We also pray for the survivors whose faith and life enabled them to rebuild in other countries their shattered lives their destroyed worlds. 
joining together, they brought about new life. They raised families in new lands in defiance of absolute terror and despair and invincible hope. Exalted by that spirit of life giving and faith, we offer this prayer. Yit Kadal, the Yit Kadash Shame Rabah. Ya ma divra hute, ya mich ma hute. The chayechon of yomechon. Uv chaye de chol beit Israel. Ha agala uvizman kari vimru. Amen. Yehe shme rava mevarach le alam o me omaya. Yit barach, yishtabach, yipaar, yitroman, yitnase. Vitadar vitale vitala shme de kudasha. Rihu Le Ela in Ko Birchata Vishirata Tushbechata Venechemata Da Amiram Belma Vimu Amen Behe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya The Chayim Alenu Vel Ko Yisrael Vimu Amen O Se Shalom Bim Romav Uya Ase Shalom Alenu Vel Ko Yisrael Al Ko Yoshve Teve Imru, amen. May the source of peace send peace to all who mourn and comfort all who are bereaved. Amen. And now we will be having a responsive prayer. Please also join in on the words that are italicized. Dear God, we are supposed to be created in your image. But oh, how have we have distorted it. When we recall the beastly acts of people, we are ashamed to be human. When we read of the nobility of their victims, we are proud to be humans. Teach us, O oh God, to honor our martyrs by being vigilant in defense of people everywhere and by fighting cruelty persecution and hate where there is hatred may we bring love where there is pain may we bring healing where there is darkness may we bring light where there is despair may we bring hope as we gather tonight we pray for courage and for strength when we remember the evils in the past the innocents tortured, maimed, and murdered. We are almost afraid to make ourselves remember, but we are even more afraid to forget. We ask for wisdom that we might mourn and not be consumed by hatred, that we might remember and yet not lose hope. We must face evil and so doing, reaffirm our faith in future good. We cannot erase yesterday's pains, but we can vow that they will not have suffered in vain. O oh God, your presence is the light piercing the darkness on our way, lighting our steps, making us see beauty and worth in all human beings. And so we pray together. For those who were given death, let us choose life for us and generations yet to come. For those who found courage to stand against evil, often at the cost of their lives. Let us vow to carry on their struggle. We must teach ourselves and our children to learn from hate that we must love, to learn from evil to live for good. We offer these words of blessing. Ruchim atem bevoachem, Ruchim atem etzitchem. Blessed are you for all of you participating in this evening's service. And as you go forth, may you bless humanity with hope, with courage, and with peace. <laughs>